the Lord's people who lived in Lida. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you, get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About the time she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa, so when the dis disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please, come at once. Peter went with them, and then he arrived, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tunner named Simon. That's the word of God. Thank God for his word. Thank you for reading, uh, Samuel. And I just realized, I think the, the live stream guys had the scripture from last week, so it disappeared. So bring your Bible next time, people. It's always good. You can browse around. Uh, you can uh, do some contextual stuff. It's good out there. Um, as you can see, the school yesterday had a graduation party. So they have this whole thing uh, set up, including those different flags. And it just made me realize we are so thankful to this school for hosting us. We've been in this place for over 20 years, I think. Um, we're just grateful for being here and worshiping in this place. And this school, I think, is a school, they speak English, but if you see those flags, uh, there are people from many different nations. Uh, and in our church, there are people from many different nations speaking all sorts of uh, languages and styles and things. Now, as you know, um, my wife, Zinash, is from Ethiopia. And uh, in the 10 years we've been married, I've not really been able to uh, master Amharic. The, the, the language that she speaks, and especially the writing. is They have like 280 characters or so. Anyway, a couple of years ago, Zinesh and I were in an Ethiopian church. There was some sort of conference in the Netherlands, and um, I didn't understand most of what was happening. But there was a man giving a testimony about uh, him being sick. He had a heart disease, and he went to the doctors, and... The doctors didn't, didn't know what to do. That there was no cure for this man. But he and the people of the church started to pray. And on that very day, Zinners and I were visiting this church. This man was giving a testimony that God had answered that prayer and that he was healed. As a matter of fact, he was holding a piece of paper from the doctor uh, saying, you know, and I could read this, this was in Dutch, the doctor writing down that this man ha was healed, um, and the doctor didn't quite understand where this was coming from. But I thought, well, how interesting is it 
that people today are still getting healed when we pray. And I know that in this room there are various people who've had a supernatural experience like this. There have been people, there are people in this room who have been sick and prayed and God answered and God healed. And if you read the Bible, it is all over the place. Jesus went around and he was teaching and preaching and he was healing people, he was raising people from the dead. The book of Acts we've been in. Uh, we read uh, multiple times Peter and John going around teaching and preaching and performing miracles, even to the extent that in Acts 5 you read that the people brought all those who were sick and laid them somewhere on the street so that only Peter's shadow would pass by. Well, it doesn't say that the shadow of Peter healed, but you know, this man had some kind of power from God to perform miracles. And the passage we read today... Uh, Peter is traveling around, and he is, well, he, Peter not, but two people are being healed, or at, le at least one is healed and one is raised from the dead. You read Peter first goes to a, city, a little town called Lydda, where he meets a man, Aeneas, who has been sick for about eight years. He couldn't walk, he was lame, he was crippled. And Peter tells him, Jesus Christ heals you, and the man stands up. And the next thing we read is that there was this lady, Tabitha or Dorcas, uh, who had actually died. Um, and, you know, she was, she was dead. We read that her body was washed. So, you know, she was really dead. Uh, but then people send out to Peter and he comes and he prays and he says to be that get up. And she stands up again. So, does healing take place? Well, in, in biblical terms, yes. Now, I should tell you that um, I've immersed myself a bit more in the book of Acts lately because we've been teaching uh, on Acts in, in Lifeline College. Uh, many of you know Lifeline. Lifeline is a young adults organization, ministry that started from this church and sort of grew, grew out of this church and way bigger, uh, known for its worship events and Bible studies. But the beginning of this year, uh, we started Lifeline College. And a friend of mine, Femi, is from a Nigerian background and church, and myself, we started teaching uh, on the New Testament. And so, you know, we have actual class on Tuesday night, you know, two-hour class. We give the students some home assignments. They have to read and send in assignments and so on. And, you know, how, how wonderful is it to uh, see that in the city of Antwerp, there are young people wanting to study the Word of God more in-depth. Now, the beautiful thing is that these students, they, they really want to learn, and they ask a lot of questions. You know, how, how do you read this? How do you make sense of that? Okay, you said this, but in this verse, it says something else. How do you interpret that? And I thought, when I read this text of Peter performing these sort of healings and miracles and how it connects to prayer, these Lifeline College students, they would ask questions. And I think some of you would ask questions like, and actually I, made, I, I figured out three questions that I think you could ask about this passage, and I have them on the screen for you here. The first one is that today, should we still expect miracles and healing to take place? Second one, and I think the answer is yes, but we'll, we'll go in depth a bit. Second one is, okay, then what, what is the purpose you know, why do these things happen? And the third one is, okay, then if we believe this is a reality, then how should we uh, pray for it? So that's going to be the sermon today. Should we still expect what's the purpose and how should we pray for it? Okay, should we still expect miracles to happen today? I would say yes. But the average... Belgian person probably would say no, right? I mean, if you live with the idea that, you know, science should explain everything, you have a sort of naturalistic idea and understanding of the world and how things go, uh, there's no way that people who are sick are, are, are getting miraculously healed or that dead are being raised. That doesn't seem very much scientific, right? 
And those kind of people often criticize Christians for being a bit narrow-minded because, you know, you believe in this old-fashioned book and so on. Well, the reality is, people, that there are numerous reports that we hear still today of people being healed in, in ways that science cannot explain. In ways that where you, it has to be some supernatural intervention. Uh, there's a book out there that I, I want to show you. It's called Miracles Today. This book is it's written from a Christian perspective, but um, this book uh, shows uh, a number of, uh, well, countless miracles that are happening today that cannot be explained scientifically. I, I want to share this one with you. Uh, Dr. Deborah Guzman had removed both of a patient's fallopian tubes. If you don't know what is in Dutch, those are eyeliders, okay? So this is about a lady. Her eyeliders had been removed because of successive, successive ectopic pregnancies, which means that a fertilized egg places itself somewhere outside of the womb in the body, which is not good. It's dangerous. This happened a couple of times. So this, the doctor removed those tubes, uh, and this was... Um, proven at some point, that tests confirmed this, and yet two years later, this lady got pregnant and had a healthy baby. This is scientifically impossible. And the patient said, wow, this is a, this is a miracle from God. You know, this, they must have prayed, and, and the doctor couldn't do anything than agree that this was something miraculous. So now, who is narrow-minded in here? If you have a, a worldview where you condense everything to be scientific, and everything has to be explained naturalistic, are you not the one being narrow-minded in here? Because there's a lot of things that science cannot explain. You know, science cannot explain love. Science cannot explain why we are here on this planet. No, it, could, it can explain how we got here, or, but why? It's not a scientific question. You know, these sort of things are real. They are confirmed in a scientific context, and they say, well, there is no scientific evidence. So who is the one being there reminded in here? Um, I'll leave it up to you. Now, to the Bible. Because if we say, well, should we expect miracles to happen today? Well, in the Bible, you see that people were actually expecting miracles. The passage we read, uh, Peter is visiting a city called Lydda, a little village. And this man, Aeneas, gets healed. And then the second story is that about this lady named Dorcas, or Tabitha in Hebrew. And this lady had died... And usually in the Israelite context, when somebody had died, the burial would take place on the very same day. You know, the, the climate is different, it is hot, uh, there were some cultural uh, issues, of course. So in a normal setting, someone dies, let's say, Thursday morning, Thursday evening, the person is in the grave. Now, if you read carefully, if you have your Bibles with you there, verse 37, we read that Dorcas had died, but her body was not buried straight away. We read that they washed the body. So, you know, these people weren't stupid. I mean, they knew that she had actually died. They washed the body, but instead of burying her, they put her in a room upstairs, which is unusual, which is remarkable. And the next thing they do is they send two men out to go and visit Peter in the next town, about a two-hour walk. And they meet Peter, and maybe they have a little conversation. They walk back for two hours, so let's say a four- to five-hour trip. Because Peter has to do something about this. Now, were these people expecting a miracle or not? Somebody had died. They washed the body. They didn't bury it. They put her in a room upstairs and asked for somebody to come and pray in order for this lady to come back to life. These people were expecting. And Peter seems to be expecting too. Peter, he joins the guys, goes to, goes to the city of Joppa, 
which is now, now, uh, nowadays uh, Jaffa in Israel. He joins them, and he meets all the, the ladies. You know, Dorcas had been a, a lady serving the poor and handing out clothes and so on, and they, should, they show all the good things she has done. And Peter sends all of them out of the room. He kneels down. He prays. And then he speaks to that, that body, and he says, Tabitha, get up. And the lady gets up. Now, if these people, if these believers were expecting God to do something, if Peter himself was expecting God to do something and pray about it, should we not today expect great things to happen when we pray? Amen? Amen. Okay, now, so let's say some, we pray and somebody gets healed, like the example we saw or... You know, there's, there's people in this church who have experienced that. Then the second question is, okay, well, why does this happen? What's, what's the purpose? Because, you know, you read a selection of people in the Bible who are being healed, and there are many others who are not being healed, and why this one, and why not this one, and why do, why do miracles and, and healing uh, happen at all? Is it just the... The drama and the show, you know, we people tend to like that. Well, let's read. I think the first thing is that it leads people to faith. And the first thing where Peter uh, heals this lame, crippled man, verse 35, it says, All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon, which is the surrounding plains, they saw him. And they turned to the Lord. So this healing is taking place. And people are amazed. They say, oh, what, what is this? And the result is that they turn to the Lord. Similarly, in the second story where Dorcas is being raised to life, we read in verse 30, 42, it says that this became known all over Joppa. And many people believed in the Lord. So that's the first reason, the first purpose, I think, of, of healing and miracles taking place. is It's not the show in itself, but it serves a greater purpose, leading people to faith in Christ. You know, the disciples and the apostles were teaching and preaching about Jesus Christ, who died and who rose again. Now, if God can raise Jesus from the dead, can he raise other people from the dead? Can he heal somebody who is sick? Oh, yes, he can. And so it leads to a second point. Um, I think, secondly, healing and miracles, they sort of uh, authenticate the gospel that is being preached. If we preach a message of salvation through Christ, who died and rose again, if we, if we preach a message of resurrection... Then it makes sense then to accompany this message with actually signs and wonders that approve this message. Uh, Mark says in his gospel, chapter 16, he says that the Lord confirmed his word by signs that accompanied it. Mark 16, 26. And similarly, uh, Luke, the author of Acts, later on in the book of Acts, he says that, you know, when Paul and Barnabas are our ministry, he said that the Lord confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and miracles. So it, they serve to lead people to faith, to authenticate the message, and ultimately to bring glory to God. Because it's not, it's not Peter who heals. It's not any kind of modern healer that goes around who heals. It's God who heals, right? When Peter speaks to Aeneas, he doesn't say, uh, Aeneas, I tell you, stand up. No, no, he says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. And so it's not about the, the person. You know, we, we people, we cannot perform miracles. We cannot heal people, but God can. If we believe in a God who walks on water, you believe in a God who raises the dead, 
Do we believe in a God who created the whole universe? Would God be unable to heal someone who is sick when we ask for him? When we ask for it? Of course not. But the glory and the honor belongs to him. And the fourth thing I think is that you know, healing and miracles take place also to strengthen the believer's faith. Of course, if you pray and God answers your prayer, it should lead to worship God, but it also is a, strengthens your faith that God is real and God is out there and you ask and God answers. And what a blessing it is if many more years are added to your life. At the same time, though, we should keep in mind that basically miracles are, are always temporary. You know, miracles may take place and healing may take place and even complete healing may take place. Uh, either in overnight, you know, in one instance or sometimes gradually. But in the end, you know, at some point you may get sick again and in some point, at some point we all leave this life. So it's not about miracle after miracle after miracle and, you know, you miracle yourself into eternity. That's not how it works. Okay? So to lead people to faith, to authenticate the gospel, to bring glory to God and to strengthen the faith of the believers. Now, third thing then is, okay, how then should we pray for miracles and healing to take place? Well, I think with expectation. If the people out there in Joppa and Lida were expecting, if Peter was expecting, we should expect. I mean, what, what's the point of asking God to do something when you actually don't expect him to do it? If you ask a God who is able and has all power and all authority in heaven and on earth to do something, and you send him a request, but you don't expect him to even answer it. What kind of prayer is that? So we're called to pray with expectation and with confidence. Confidence in God, who is able to, to do more than we can even think or imagine. At the same time, I think we should learn to pray with wisdom and discernment and sensitivity because should all people get healed at all times this is a tough one is there a difference in praying for a little baby who has a whole life in front of him or an old person who has been healed several times and is just at the end of the race The Apostle Paul has an interesting look on life. He says, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And so, we should remember, although we want God to do things, and we can present our requests to Him, we should remember that, in a way, death is God's ultimate door to life. And a gateway to triumph and eternal glory. Now, it doesn't seem that we, you know, we should just want anybody to die, of course. But it's a different angle on life. Because if we are in Christ, death is not the end. And so, yes, we may expect, and we may pray, and we may ask, and we may beg for God to do something. But you know what's the interesting thing? If you ask, God will always answer. Because sometimes no also is an answer. And sometimes having to give up somebody, it's, it is painful and it is horrible and it is terrible. But it is not the end. Because we believe in the God who raises the dead. And that one day all of us will join him in the resurrection. Now, fourth, I think we should admit that um, some people have this gift of, of healing and performing miracles. 
The believers in Joppa, they could have prayed. So they washed the body of, uh, of Dorcas. They put her up in the room. They could have prayed. They could have asked for help from a local minister. But they go and send two guys to Peter, who is quite a, a bit away, and get Peter to come. 1 Corinthians 12, we read about the various gifts of the Spirit, and that the, the Holy Spirit in, uh, distributes gifts as He wishes to different people. And one of those gifts is healing, but there are many other gifts. Um, of course, we can all pray and ask and put our requests to God, but we should... Uh, we should recognize that there are certain people who have a special gift from God in the area of healing. As a matter of fact, the Apostle James, in his letter, he puts out quite a specific uh, procedure. He says, if anybody among you is sick, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, in our church, we're not talking about elders, but we have a pastoral team that is always happy to pray with you. Uh, usually they're most visible during communion when they're out here to pray with you. But they can pray with you one-on-one. -on -one. They are happy to pray with you during the week. A couple weeks ago on Wednesday night, there was a prayer evening. There are specific people with a spiritual task, you could say, of, of praying. And some people have a specific gift of healing doesn't mean that you cannot go and ask God. You can go freely. God is your father and you're his child and you may ask and request as much as you want. But keep that in mind. Now there's one other question that I would expect my Lifeline College students to ask and, and the AIPC people as well. Now what if you pray and God does not answer. What if somebody gets sick and you pray and you pray and you pray and it does seem so right? You seem to be asking for the right thing, but God does not answer. Well, let me tell you a story. There's a man called Nabil Qureshi. And I have a picture of him on the screen. Nabil Qureshi uh, was born as a Muslim and at some point, came to faith in Christ. Became a very, very effective minister of the gospel. He was in apologetics. He was out there defending the Christian faith. He knew the Quran from the inside out, but also the Bible. So he was able to communicate the gospel in a powerful way to Muslim people. And from a human or even from a Christian perspective, this man had a long, fruitful ministry ahead of him. But he got sick. Stage four stomach cancer. And this man was famous in the Christian world and thousands, if not millions of people prayed for him <coughs> to get healed. But in 2017, Nabil died at age 34, a few years older than I am. He left behind a, a wife and a young girl. What about that? Well, sometimes we should admit that we do not always understand God's ways. We put our requests and we ask and we beg. But God's ways aren't always our ways. And our ways aren't always God's ways. And it is painful. But in such occasions, we, we may need to resemble with the Apostle Paul. Who had a thorn in his flesh. 
And he says in 2 Corinthians 12 that he prayed to the Lord three times. We don't know what this thorn was exactly, but something that bothered him in his body. He prayed to the Lord three times for it to be removed. But it was not removed. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And instead of boasting about all his qualities, Paul started boasting about his weakness because he knew that when he was weak, then Christ is strong. And so, yes, we can ask, but we can't force God. That's why Jesus teaches us to pray, and Jesus himself modeled this prayer. He said, if possible, let this cup pass, but not my will, but your will be done. In the end, we want God's will to be done. And God's will is sometimes different from what we want or expect. But yet, we should go and ask and learn the rhythm of His grace and His time. Now, should we then stop asking? No, I don't think so. Because there are still miracles happening. People are still being healed in the name of Jesus. Today. I shared with you this example of uh, the Ethiopian church I went to. There was a man and he was there and I saw him face to face and he seemed in good shape. You all know Deborah from our church. Uh, last week, Pastor Zeke referred to her. She has a YouTube video out on our YouTube channel how God miraculously healed her. And she's giving praise and glory and honor to God for that. There are still books being written about the wonderful things God is doing in this world today. So if we come today to God, we should come with confidence and with expectation that he will, ask, that he will answer. Because he says, knock and I will open the door. Seek and you shall find. So I'm going to invite our brother Samuel to come up. He's going to lead us in a, a time of prayer specifically for this. And I don't know what it is in your life that you may need healing from. Maybe it is something physical in your body. Maybe it is something emotional or mental or a deep pain or a deep hurt in your soul. I would invite you to bring it to God and ask for healing and expect Him to answer. And then give Him the glory when He does. Samuel, the floor is yours. And he's going to lead us in the time of prayer. Thank you. So, my son just asked me if I was nervous. So, I hope you can't say, but yes, I am. But uh, I'm also honored to be here. Uh, I have some papers who help me with the language, of course. But I, of course, I have to adapt a little bit. And uh, as Jan was preaching, and he was saying about what if God doesn't heal us here today? We will pray for healing. What if? And uh, every time that I think about that, I remember Daniel's friends when they were uh, brought uh, to Nabucodonosor. And he asked, can your God uh, deliver you from me, the almighty, powerful king? And their answer was, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. We are, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods and worship the image of gold you have set up. That's the faith that they had. They knew that God could do it, but their faith wasn't based on what he would do. It was based on what he has read done to them how he reached to them. So we will pray for healing in just a minute. 
And on the expectations, in Hebrews it said, now faith is assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. So it might be that the healing that you pray for here this morning is something that you have been praying for a long time. It's something that you don't see how it can be done. But faith is the conviction of things not seen. Not seen by us, but from the eternity, God knows. God has seen already that you were healed here today, or your family member, or your neighbor, or that person in the hospital, or someone in your home country. It doesn't matter where, because God can go, our prayers can go where, to place where we cannot. And that's what we are going to do this morning. So, Zeke also asked us to pray it like we pray, more likely in our home country. So, for us, praying for healing is really, well, Brazil is a huge country, so I can't speak for everyone, but uh, in general, for me, healing means really putting our face uh, in test. So, I will invite you for, to pray. You will pray for yourself or for someone specific. Not a generic praying. Because God knows what you want him to do. He just wants you to say that. To be specific because you have faith that that miracle can happen. So choose if it's not yourself, it's someone else. But pray for a specific healing. I will invite you to, to close your eyes and uh, put your hands over the body part that you need healing. If you feel comfortable with that, can be your arms, shoulders, liver, kidneys, joints, your head. If it's a physical or mental healing that you need. Your heart, if it's physical or an emotional healing that you need, whatever it is, just put it into God's hand right now. Let's pray in this moment. Heavenly Father, dear Father, we are here because you have found us and show, showed us your infinite love and forgiveness through Jesus' sacrifice. We know death is already defeated and we will live for eternity with you. But this morning, we lift up our voice to ask for healing. We ask that you listen to us and we will glorify your name once more. For giving us much more than what we deserve. Hear our voice. Answer our petition. And we will testify to your power to the nations. I wish I had the words to name all the pain, suffering that you can transform here today. But I don't. So I declare this morning that there is no pain, no disease nor diagnose, no anxiety, no fear, no dark place, no despair, no, no lack of hope, no loneliness, no trauma or relationship issue that can resist to your touch and presence. We pray like Jeremiah, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Overflow this place with your Holy Spirit. Come and heal. We declare that our home, hospitals, neighbors, city, here in, an, in our home countries, are now and forever yours to heal and reign. In the name of Jesus, come and heal body, mind, and the spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Imagine. 
here we have another new song for the for the church but i think a lot of you already know it it's an old song by chris tomlin sing 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 Good to be together today to celebrate the goodness of God and ask for all that we need. 
summer, we have about 20 of our teenagers and our leaders are going to Teen Street. It's a camp in Germany. They are so excited to go. It's about double, more than double the number who went last year. They are really excited to go. And to help pay for that cost, they did a fundraiser a few weeks ago and also today. Uh, you have the chance, you can make a donation of however much you wish to buy a sandwich or a hot dog. You might have noticed all those panini makers on your way in. That's what they're there for. So go and be generous in making donation uh, to send our kids to camp this summer and enjoy uh, a bit of food as you uh, talk with one another. Now receive the benediction. This is God's blessing for you today. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.